All right, welcome back. Let's get started with our next talk. Please welcome Mike Kaiser giving a talk entitled, I am Spartacus and you can be too, Spartacus as a service. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unnecessary applause, but thank you anyway. Um, I'm Mike Kaiser. Who I am is unimportant. You can find me online. I'm not going to have a biological slide or anything like that. Instead, well, we're going to start with a refresher on an old story. Who here has seen the 1960s movie Spartacus? That's quite a few, we'll say. We're going to review just the basic story here, just a level set. Um, and it begins with where every great story does, with Kirk Douglas, sweaty, hot, cleft-chinned. He was a gladiator. Uh, the real Spartacus was not Kirk Douglas. The real Spartacus lived in about 70 BC. And by lived, I mean that's when he rebelled. He was a gladiator. He led a rebellion, took 70 or so of his fel fellow gladiators with him, and formed an army. They gathered more and more men, more and more soldiers. And what happens when you gather an army? Oh, by the way, this is what a gladiator looks like. This is a rebellion of gladiators. I'm not quite sure what the physics are in play here, but that's okay. What happens uh, when you rebel against Rome? Well, Rome comes after you. Rome came after the real Spartacus three times. And the first two times, for sure, the third time is a little unclear, Spartacus and his army smoked them. Uh, they defeated them soundly. Now, but what happens if you rebel against some place like Rome? Well, eventually you lose, right? Because Rome is Rome and you're just kind of small potatoes. And, and at this point, I'm switching to, again, the movie that many of you have seen, which I consider the canonical form of the story. So they capture his whole army, they capture Spartacus, they want Spartacus. They want to know who he is, but they don't know who he is. And so they sit the entire army of rebels down and they say, tomorrow you are all going to die unless one of you tells us who Spartacus is. As Laurence Olivier being brutal, right? And then uh, uh, Spartacus, Kirk is sitting there, um, looks around, looks around, is about to stand up. And then one by one, we all know, his men jump up and yell, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. Much like it would look like if we did it in this room today, don't do it right now. Uh, upshot is, they couldn't tell who Spartacus was, right? Because his privacy was obscured. There were too many Spartacuses available to choose from. And he, uh, he acquired in that moment what he wanted. He wanted his past to be forgotten. He wanted to be unknown. He wanted privacy. Spoiler alert, they all died the next day. But in that moment, it was a glorious, glorious 30 seconds to a minute, especially on film. Um, so what I wanted to do um, after seeing this film a couple times recently, a couple years ago, is it gave me an idea. I was, I was thinking about the right to be forgotten and privacy, and I wanted to know how bad things really were. And since I've been on the internet since like 93 or 94, I was a tampered case. What I wanted was something uh, to kind of level set, uh, white space, greenfield, whatever you want to call it. So I did what anyone would do in my situation. I went to Target and I bought a phone with a credit card on film. Terrible operational security, but now I had a phone for a fake identity I wanted to create. This is my my friend, there's probably enough information that you could go and hunt her down or one of her replicants. Um, you know, she was old enough, she lives in Austin where I live, she loves running, she loves reading, she's a graphics designer and really involved in that community in Austin, um, or so people think, and her relationship status is, it's complicated, which opens her up to a lot of unusual discussions. So like I said, I created my friend, uh, which is a little bit more complicated than I thought for reasons I'll go into in a bit, uh, signed her up for various online applications. 
social media apps primarily, 24, 25 of them. Uh, some of these you'd expect, some maybe not, right? I, I started with the basics or the trifecta, Facebook, Google, and Twitter, and then added more. Uh, the, because I had a prepaid phone, it was a little bit difficult because Twitter realized it's a prepaid phone, but that was okay. I signed up for a Google account, and that gave me an email address to sign up for the Twitter account. I was learning how to do this step by step. You also notice other things on here, um, like MySpace, because who doesn't love a good MIDI song? And I signed her also up for several dating apps in the area, Bumble, and I also signed her up, which I questioned my choices at the time, for Ashley Madison. <laughs> now, the big risk here was that I had put her in my own area code which means there was a chance I would see someone I knew trolling for someone I didn't know. Um, that didn't happen, thank goodness. I did not see anyone I knew, but spoiler alert, and probably more than at least half of you in this room would already know this, don't be a woman on the internet. There are many, many things I can't unsee. She got unsolicited pictures. She got hit on on every network including LinkedIn, which, anyway, staggers my imagination. I think it's a great social experiment to understand what reality is like. What I did then was I went about trying to erase her and see how long she stood around because, you know, she's got some normal data in blue that wouldn't, she wouldn't care if it was out there, but there's always that sensitive data, right? Those controversial statements or those photos or whatever else. And so as I had signed her up uh, and started deleting her, I finally went through and I read through all 24, 25 different privacy agreement and terms, line by line. It's not very exciting. Um, sometimes you find things you expect but, not, but more horrific than you expect. For instance, this is in the Pinterest terms of service, which is one of the most unusual ones I found. These are almost back-to-back -back statements. It says, you retain all rights to everything you post, two sentences later, but by posting you give us, what, 20, like 15 different verbs to do with that data? So it's kind of a dumpster fire. In summary of all of those, things you'd expect here, right? Five of these, 24, 25, track you on third-party sites even if you're not logged into them, right? Facebook or other people will know through tracking pickle, pixels and the like that you're looking for uh, rutabagas or something of that nature. 14 of them just tell you straight up, we're going to sell your data. Uh, we're going to sell what you do, what you like, some of your attributes. And the, a lot of times they will couch it in uh, customized advertising language. That's kind of basically what they, what they mean. And then eight of them basically said, we're going to keep your data and we're not going to put ourselves under any obligation ever to, to lose or get rid of your data. And, and this is beyond some of the times what you'll see, which is a... Uh, uh, we have to keep your data for a certain period for financial regulations. This was just we're going to make no promises. We might hold on to it forever. So, exciting. Now, those of us in this room, we're not really surprised by that, right? Um, we kind of know the game plan. We kind of know what the current situation is. When I talk to friends, when I talk to family, uh, sometimes it's harder to explain what they're agreeing to for signing up for those services or how long they will last and how they can't be forgotten on the internet. There's a tool out there um, called Terms of Service Didn't Read. I'll show it to you live in a minute, um, but this is a browser-based plugin uh, that you can install that every site you go to, it gives people a letter grade in their browser telling you this is a great site, this is a bad site, and if you click on it, it'll break it down, obviously it's color-coded, it'll break it down as to what they've agreed to by using or signing up for that site. I, I highly recommend uh, you know, using this, uh, but I also highly recommend giving this to your friends and associates to alarm them and make them more aware of what they've agreed to. So, 
terms of service were pretty bad that my friend agreed to. Her data may be around for a long time. Even if they delete it, it's already sold to advertisers, right? But what about data privacy laws, you might be saying? Mike, that'll fix everything. Right? Well, my name is Mike, by the way. That's why you would say that. Um, you know, United Nations uh, considers privacy a human right, and there are different expressions of that. Most famous one is the GDPR. You've seen the Equifax stuff. You've seen the Marriott stuff. Fines are starting to come in. So there's a little bit more attention being paid to that. Um, but it's, it's a good start, but it's not going to do a whole heck of a lot anywhere, you know, in the near future. And if you look at the larger picture, if you look at uh, regulation worldwide, it's sketchy, right? Um, there are 120 or so countries with national, uh, with national privacy laws either enacted or in progress. Um, you have, of course, the GDPR, you have uh, which does fines, you have PDPA and down the Philippines which does jail time for people. And then there are the lighter colored countries, including the United States, of course, which has no national privacy law. We have things cooking like CCPA and New York, and there are at least six or seven senators that are trying to introduce legislation. But again, even if they do, you just do like a tax haven and go to the lowest common denominator where you don't have to protect privacy. Which brings us to option C, I'll call it. So we can't rely on enterprises to protect our privacy or to not sell our data, and we can't rely on governments necessarily to enforce things. So we need a third option, an option that will basically give my friend and us and others like us uh, the possibility of having privacy. And to do that, we're going to go back to Sweaty Man. Uh, we're going to take our inspiration from the story of Spartacus and try and take matters into our own hands, however horrific that might turn out, privacy via obfuscation. And so what I did after I had gone through all of this um, is I started writing um, an open source tool. I called it Spartacus as a Service. A friend recommended that because the acronym wasn't taken. And um, so what I did was I used Node because I vaguely knew JavaScript and I was looking for just the easiest route on because all I really wanted to do here in the beginning was get a proof of concept, make something, see if I could alter advertising to see what was possible. So it's written in Node. It has the convenience of having the passport module which does all the OAuth for a lot of the services for you so I wouldn't have to muck about doing token work per se. Um, and then I'll talk about that last one in just a minute. Um, I pushed the latest version to GitHub yesterday, I think. So every, almost everything you're going to see in the demo today is there online and you can download it. The tool takes three tactics and they are tactics stolen from location, uh, from obscuring your location if you're trying to hide that. There's a whole book, you can read it about it, um, called Obfuscation, I think, from Harvard Press. Um, and there are three ways to do this, um, if you think about location. Enlarging the radius, shifting the center, and filling your channel with noise. Now, these first two um, have to do more with creating multiple U's or multiple whatever the target identity is and the third one is a slightly different jam. So let's talk about those first two first. First, enlarging the radius. Uh, this is where you take the identity and you take one key attribute, whether it's name or location or a couple of them, and you replicate them across 20, 30, scale up to as many as you want to identities that look a lot like you, sound a lot like you, but they're not quite you. The idea here is the same thing as in Top Gun, which is now a reference I can use again because Tom is making another movie. You remember he's flying along, he's being attacked, well, actually every airplane movie ever, and what they do? They throw out chaff, right? To confuse the missile coming. That's the same concept here. You're not making it impossible to find you, but you're making it more difficult. Second way is very similar, except this time instead of a text-based attribute, 
We're doing it with images, with faces. This exists because of reverse Google image search. I mean, maybe it's just me, but who hasn't looked themselves up to see how popular they are or where they're, they're listed, where they're, what information is about them? You might want to do that when you go home. The way to do both of these is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, the Faker library is out there and that can generate a huge amount of data and save yourself a lot of time. People use this a lot for unit testing in software development, uh, sometimes for fuzzing. Um, it can uh, generate from a database, like I said, quite a bit. The tool at this point uses what's shown on the screen, basic information, username, password, email, a URL link to an image. Um, this library can also give uh, account data, fake transactions, a brief bio background. It, it's pretty wide sweeping. Now note that um, things like it says older than 21 on the date of birth, a lot of times it will return a date of birth but it's not going to put any restrictions other than it being in the past. So if you want to use this and have correlation between birth dates and death dates or anything else, you're going to have to put filters on that. So for example, I put a check to make sure that date of birth was older than 21 because that's just gross. So to take a look at that real quick, I'll show you here in the tool. So this is what it looks like. Again, this is just node running in an express uh, instance which makes it really easy and pretty to demonstrate in public. And then you can either OAuth in, which I'll show you in just a minute. Whoa. Or you can come down here to create identity set. And what this is going to do is it's going to present you with basically exactly what you would think. You choose how many identities and then you put in what you want common to those identities. If you don't put anything in these fields, then you get basically a JSON dump of all of the data. You can see different names, different addresses, different phone numbers. Obviously, there's no real phone number or email address behind these, um, but just FYI. If I put in something that I want common to all of them, say a first and last name, or if I wanted everyone to look like Justin Timberlake, I could do that. And now all my data matches up that's probably really hard to see in the back. All have the same first and last name. The idea here is it's facilitating those use cases. And what I can do now, or I've done in the past, is I've taken that information and now I want to process that in bulk. Now, this isn't quite finished. I tried this a couple times with Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is great, but Remember, we're dealing with some kind of uh, verification. Um, in other words, there's going to be some kind of email or some kind of phone based verification. Remember I said earlier that Twitter caught the phone number. Email is, is relatively easy. You could spin up your own domain. There are lots of email addresses that can be temporary and can be used and you can forward those to whoever's doing the work for you on something like Turk. Um, but phones are more difficult. Uh, they're catching prepaid phones, they're catching obviously Google Voice. If your number has been cycled too many times or too quickly, it won't work either. Uh, from day to day, Google Voice has worked or hasn't worked. Um, and I really, I'm looking for a way to make this programmatic. Obviously temporary numbers, I'd rather not buy a thousand SIMs or anything like that. So if you have ideas, I'm all ears. Um, Cause that would really help this part of the project. Side note, when I was doing this, when I first made my friend's profile and her backstory, which I had a whole backstory for, this was a picture I used. This is not my friend, obviously. Not the picture that I'm using today either. Uh, and I blurred her before because I'd like her to not be swamped and live a little bit longer in her fake existence. Uh, I use this picture and I was having a great time and posting content and meeting graphic designers in Austin who thought I was a 30 year old woman. Um, and then my friend called me up and he said, hey Mike, y you don't want to use this picture. I was like, what? what's wrong with using this picture? He said, well, 
she's not a white space. She's not Greenfield. I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, have you done a Google reverse image search on her? I said, no. Is she on, you know, a couple sites, like 10, 20? He's like, no, just go do it. So I did. 25 billion sites use her photo. And as is obvious now, why is that? Because everyone's doing the same thing I was doing. If you're writing a bot, where do you go look for an image? Open source, stock photography, because you don't feel like there's any licensing or any issues there, right? Almost every, actually everyone, I haven't found one that's not like this, that isn't just all over the place. This, the picture of this woman has been used to represent policymakers in Washington, D.C., sex workers in Nevada. There is a mystery novel writer selling books on Amazon that uses this photo on her website to represent herself. So the big takeaway, if you take away one thing from this talk, it's that you don't really need a tool to obscure yourself, to give yourself privacy of your image. Just be sure you're in lots of stock photography looking really happy. And then every dream you have will be realized. You'll be an author, you'll be a playwright, you'll be some other things too, but I mean, choose wisely, but that's, that's one route you could choose to go. So I, upshot is, lesson learned, I changed the photo. So that is the, the first two, right? Enlarging the radius and shifting the center. Uh, let's talk about something I, I find kind of more interesting, to be honest, which is the process I call filling the channel with noise. This is not creating new identities. This is just diluting the information that's out there about you on your existing identities so that people looking for you or people doing surveillance or whatever else has less of an opportunity to know what's real and what's not. Very similar to the talk uh, on sartorial fashion we just heard. So basically it's taking something like this. Uh, my friend originally um, was an avid reader and a, and a she ran every other day. By the way, if you're faking an identity, choose repetitive hobbies. Dead simple to tweet about. I ran five miles. I'm exhausted. I read this book. Really, really easy. Um, she was also searching for mattresses and looking to buy a Volvo, which seems like an odd combination, except that those are orthogonal. And so I didn't think one would necessarily be related to the other. And that way I knew if I got advertising, which I started to measure, if I got advertising for a Volvo, uh, then I had a good sense that it was because she'd been searching for it or tweeting about it. And we've all had this feeling, right? Uh, you know, you're talking to Alexa if you have one of those or your friend and you have a discussion and all of a sudden advertising is, is popping up. Well, the idea of this use case is to flood the channel, like I said, with other things. In this case, I was using barbecue and politics and violins by hand, basically to throw off advertising, uh, to make sure they didn't quite know who she was, what she was into, and thus give her some kind of privacy. Now, as you might imagine, doing this across 24 apps is a pain, right? Because you'd have to go to every one of these, and to do this programmatically, create an app on those and get an API key and all of that. So I started with three, and that's where the tool is today. Uh, the first one I started with was Facebook. Um, and that was great, it was pretty easy. And Facebook is kind of like the Wild West, or it was. You could, you could do programmatically put things on anyone's wall and it looked like it came from them once they had given you OAuth approval to do so with your app. Um, good for Facebook. They realized that was probably a bad idea. So in 2018, they shut that part of the API down. For four months, I still had hope because they left the Life Events API open. So while I couldn't put content for them, I could have my target or my friend, uh, get married, get divorced, move to Arizona, have three children, live in a bus down by the river, and then they shut that down too. So Facebook is, is kind of a hard nut to crack. At this point, you can, you can put pages or links to pages on their 
uh, Facebook wall as if it came from them, but it is all based, it's an iframe from, from, fra uh, from Facebook and you can't pre-fill the text so it's a little more complicated. I'm looking at ways to do an end around like with Instagram or something else because all I really want to do is influence that same uh, marketing bucket. Google uh, is pretty easy pretty table stakes. Um, basically once you get them OAuth in, uh, the tool I'll show you here in a little bit, but it can go out and just do a search at a rate that doesn't get rate limited and counts as independent searches for Google. Because um, basically what you're trying to do, of course, is alter, uh, alter basically this page. Uh, this is an account I made earlier this week. Um, and already it's decided basically almost out of the box that this is what he's into. Uh, mid almost middle aged male, of course he likes football for some reason. Anyway, the idea is here you're shifting this, uh, this perception of the target with those Google searches and the like. Now, in the future I was given the pretty great idea uh, this week that what you could also do is since Google historically, although they say they're not doing it as much anymore, historically has searched through your email and indexed it to get flight appointments or um, doctor's appointments or purchases and receipts. Um, you could set up um, a uh, service where we could send email to a, a Google account have a filter on the receiving Google account, you'd never see it, but it'd be automatically altering what they thought you were interested in and what you were doing. And then Twitter. Um, Twitter was the most exciting to me because that was going to be more creative uh, than some of the others. I wanted a content generator that I could use to generate tweets and I wanted it to be uh, realistic enough to alter advertising and to be fun, but I also wanted it to be mutable and not mutable, but mutable. In other words, you could turn it off or filter it out. Uh, to do this, I originally used a Markov chain generator. Um, you can Google all these terms here in a minute. I'm going to try and explain what I use, but it's, you know, time constraints and all of that. These, these are great because it uses word frequency and goes kind of state to state in a state graph. And occasionally it can produce really great stuff uh, like this tweet from June. Uh, it says, indeed Jane, you ought to believe me. No one who has ever seen you together can doubt his affection or his admiration for the basting of pork ribs. Could she have seen half as much love in Mr. Darcy for herself she would have been concerned with data privacy. So this is a mashup with uh, Markov chains. The other thing you can do is you can combine sources. So this is a combination of Jane Austen, um, the How to Barbecue from Aaron Franklin, May He Live Forever from Austin, Texas, and um, the actual text of the GDPR regulation. So not quite the best-selling fiction I'm going to be able to go sell, um, that's a different village probably. Um, but the problem with this, this is one tweet out of like 10,000 that worked this well, which is why I took a screenshot of it obviously. Um, a lot of times what it, it sounded like was just too awkward, um, too not great. And so I shifted to a recurrent neural network to do this. Um, and the part of that is because Markov chains don't remember the full history. They just remember like a, someone with a really short term memory, like someone with a severe head trauma. Um, so in the short range, it does great. So for example, this sentence, I grew up in France speaking French, right? Pretty simple. There's not much gap between the, the history of the prompt and what you want the, the Markov chain to fill in. Now, it has much more of a problem with something like this where there's more space, where it's I grew up in France, then I moved to Germany, spent several years studying Basque pottery under a master, and then wrote a best-selling book. When I was young, I spoke. Now, other than being pretentious, this is a, just a long sentence with more information. And so by the time you get to where you need to fill in the word, the Markov chain just basically looks really close to where it needs to fill it in and so sometimes can do something totally weird. At least that's in the ballpark. It knows it's a language. 
um, but it doesn't quite know what you're looking for, so it takes a pot shot. Now, uh, a recurrent neural network will remember everything. Um, in fact, depending on how it's designed, it will remember everything in your text, and so it can say, oh, well, this is a continuation of what came before, so obviously he's into French. So it bought me, uh, I felt like more coherence. Caveat at this point. All of this is just my experience. My past training with Markov chain generators and artificial intelligence is like zero. So may have just been doing the execution of this wrong, but it also gives hope to everyone in this room to be able to do the same thing because I'm just using kind of off the shelf stuff to do this. So uh, the neural network, like I said, it's time series based machine learning, has a long term memory. You can train, you can rent GPU time and train it and then you can have a model that you can use wherever you want uh, to be able to generate this kind of content, whether it's JavaScript or Node or whatever else. Currently available in the tool um, is this cast of characters. Some of this came with the, uh, the open source uh, neural net base. Some of them I self-generated. So you have things you um, like Hemingway and Darwin, uh, you have Dubois, you have uh, Hermione's mom, obviously. You have Aaron Franklin, which is very specific to me. Uh, that's the barbecue guy out of Austin, Texas. Let me know if you need a brisket later on. And things like, um, oh, every state of the union from the beginning of the United States until about the Obama years. Because no one needs that extra, extra words. Let's just put it like that. Um, to train a model, I used something called paper space. Uh, again, because it was easy. This is a GPU rental facility. There are many like it. Um, I have all the, the instructions here. You can have them later to go and do this yourself. Basically, you, you download the package and then you go and you find your text. Now, um, your text, you can go to Gutenberg. I did it earlier um, where I downloaded today, actually. I downloaded uh, the Sherlock Holmes Complete Works. Really, it's any text you want. Uh, it needs to be if it's just UTF-8 text, it needs to be about 500K or bigger for it to start to be viable. Uh, the cool thing about uh, this type of neural network is that it learns syntax and format as well. So if you fed it uh, the source code for a library, it could start giving you source code back. Um, it wouldn't necessarily run and who knows what it would do, but it would look pretty cool. So after you run the job, um, it goes out there and does it, gives you feedback as it goes and it trains it up. Um, and then what you do after that is you wait. And depending on how many, how long you want to train it, um, it takes a little while. It, I started one earlier today. I'll show you in just a minute. Um, like I said, it was Sherlock Holmes. It took 35 minutes and cost me a dollar or 50 cents. So very easy to do, very viable. Um, like I said, anything, any text you have, it would work. Yeah, you go out and you download the model, you put it in a particular file um, in the Spartacus tool and it will automatically pick it up from a drop down list and add it to your sources. So like I said, what I wanted to do was I wanted to flood the channel with noise um, and start it in this state and then started altering it in part with the tool and some by hand. And let me show you what the tool actually looks like here. So we've seen this before, except this time we're actually going to OAuth in with an identity I created a couple days ago. You see Twitter, he's already logged into Twitter so he kicked back. And so now he's actually logged into all three and it, it linked them in a, in a common session because I've been using it all day. Uh, Facebook obviously doesn't do anything at the moment, but Google and Twitter do. Like I said, what Google is going to do for now is you can choose from one of the models that are in the system that come with it automatically when you, when you clone the repo and then you can choose whatever it is, for example, barbecue and choose how many repetitions you want it to search for it to alter your search history and then it goes out and does it. This is a lot like Selenium. 
um, as a base, but it's still in the package. And so you can go out and do whatever you want. It will start altering um, what your search history is and how Google thinks of you in the background. So simple case for, for Google. Now, Twitter. This is a, a little bit more interesting because it's using the recurrent neural network I was talking about. So what you do is you choose what model you want to use and then you give it, it's already starting to try, then you give it a prompt. In other words, you give it a seed text because it needs something to start. Somebody give me a, a five or six word half sentence. If it wasn't for my horse. Great. That was the fastest response I've ever gotten. Thank you. And then once you hit the reset, it takes a shot at it. So once my horse, I uh, useful. See, there's sometimes it works really well. This is a lot better than Markov chain was. Sometimes it sounds like someone fell in the bathtub, hit their head, and started tweeting about it. Um, but, and Harry Potter can be a little creepy because, actually if you do it too quick it does that because the history blows up. There we go. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's talking about children. Um, if you do someone like Hemingway, you tend to get, wow, that was really odd. You tend to get shorter sentences, there's more violence and more alcoholism in general. Um, Shakespeare is interesting because it's a play and remember it does formatting. So a lot of times you get lines and sometimes you even get stage direction. You know, exit stage left eaten by a bear or something like that. Which you may or may not want to tweet about. Um, if you do State of the Union, it gets the opposite. It gets really long and I mean picture yourself sitting in Congress. That's, that's the experience you get, right? It's, clause after clause. Regardless, um, you'll also note that there is a prefix tag here, right? What that is, is that mutability I was talking about before, where, you know, you don't necessarily want to flood uh, your Twitter account or your social media accounts with Harry Potter fan fiction. It's just kind of weird. So when you hit the obfuscate button, what will happen is it will go out and tweet on your behalf and we can see it <laughs> you can see it microscopically. So you can see that it, it's been tweeting on my behalf off and on all day, but there's a prefix. And so what that means is you can tell people you care about and that you don't want to infuriate, you can say, look, set up a mute function for this string so that you know this didn't come from me and I'm not crazy insane, um, which is helpful. Um, remember this is also, uh, these are also all uh, node based still. I have not, it gives the opportunity to transform these into web services but I haven't done that yet. That's kind of one of my next steps to make it more programmatic so you could script it. Now, while this is for Twitter, this has a wide range of applications for some of the other social media apps. Anything that, that relies on uh, text-based content creation, that sort of thing uh, could use this. And so with that passport module on Node, you can actually uh, set up the authentication once you get the API key, you can set up the authentication rapidly and then you can add on those modules app by app and fairly quickly build on uh, what's already going on. So, over time I did that with my friend and her ongoing saga here. And she started to look more like this. Um, she was really into brisket and pork ribs for a while and just sounded like a crazy person talking about national problems because she was sometimes liberal, sometimes conservative and sometimes just really bad politically informed. Um, and then I, I manually added on violins just to give a little more color to it. Um, over time, and this is really hard to see in the end, uh, what I have here is I wanted some kind of science-y feel to this. So as I was doing it, I was measuring manually at this point um, how advertising was changing over time. So before Spartacus, we have BS and AS before Spartacus and after Spartacus. 
Um, beforehand, she was really getting a lot of uh, Stearns and Foster, Tempur-Pedic, those kinds of things, and she was really into the C90 Volvo or something. Uh, over time, that actually dropped. And so mattresses dropped from like 50% of the advertising down to about 15. Now, keep in mind, this was me doing it every day for like three or four weeks. But upshot is it actually changed uh, how advertisers viewed her. Who they thought she was, uh, what they knew about her was now different. Um, she had other things, obviously, the things I was actually pumping content at and searching for uh, started to influence it. In about 18 hours after I started, uh, she started getting advertisements for full on uh, displaced smoking units for barbecue, which she didn't buy, but it was helpful. Um, so this should be your next question. You should be thinking, Mike, this is, this is fun, but is this practical? Does this have any value? To which I reply, yes and no, right? Both and. You don't necessarily want to flood your social media life with crap. You might, you know, that's your own issue. Um, at the same time, uh, this kind of concept, uh, replicating yourself to hide who you really are and your identity, uh, creating enough content that no one can tell what your true content is, or even filling fake accounts with fake content has applications. Uh, think of, of people who are being stalked or people who are being sought after. Someone who's searching an ex or an ex-partner, searching for someone across state lines, trying to find out where they are now, what their life is like now to be involved in. That is a great question. The question was, does the Twitter API allow you to ge do geolocation? I haven't looked. That's one of my next things to do is to actually uh, spoof location. Now, keep in mind, it's running locally uh, and it's just doing OAuth so that I think a VPN would come into play because as far as Twitter knows, you're tweeting in from whatever that is. So, but I think programmatically we'd be better and more efficient. That's a good point. Um, in addition to personal issues, you know, in 2017, the United States government announced they were going to start requiring social media accounts from people applying for visas or coming uh, into the country. And in June, they announced that any social media accounts you've used for the past five years, you would need to turn in to the government so they could review it and look at it. So uh, there's a potential application there, like uh, a set of fake accounts or fake content. Uh, as a way of end arounding uh, violations of privacy in that way. More recently still, um, in June of this year, there was a uh, journalist who came into Austin, Texas, my hometown, which personally applicable to me. It's very lovely to come into costumes in Austin usually. I hardly stop walking. Um, it's like 10 minutes and I'm out if I have a carry-on. This guy came in, got stopped, you can read the story uh, in The Intercept, was held for five hours. They went through all his stuff, all his social media accounts. So it's, it's this kind of thing. Uh, and even the, uh, five days ago, the EFF uh, released a latest report on what this means and what the implications are for people looking at your social media, whether they're doing it for a job or more particularly in this case, in immigration. And even if there's not a special situation where someone's in danger or it's a refugee seeking asylum who's afraid to give their accounts because they already fear violence back home, it's not a foreign concept for anybody. Right? Uh, this is a quote uh, first seen in Banksy Graffiti. Uh, first attributed riff off of, anybody remember? Andy Warhol. Everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. What's the kicker on both of those stories? Neither one actually did either of them. Warhol didn't say it and Banksy didn't draw it. But it makes a cool story which is the same kind of vibe here, right? What, what I like about doing this tool and what I like about telling the story of Spartacus 
and in fact, using stickers to do it, is that people get it, right? The people that are not in this room, people that are normal, that aren't concerned with security, they don't say, oh, I have no idea what you're talking about. They say, oh, I, I want that. How, how can I buy that? How can I know more about that? And so that's the power of a story like Spartacus, is that it gives us a chance to advocate for them, for people who are in trouble, but also uh, to be like Kirk Douglas, or his friends, rather, uh, and help have those discussions so that people around us know more and are empowered to protect their own privacy through obfuscation. Thank you. All right. If you have any questions for Q&A, I am walking on up to the podium. Please make an orderly line or a disorderly line in light of the slave revolt theme here. Nobody else has one. I have a okay. question. Okay. Is your tool available in the Russian language? The Faker tool actually flips whatever language you want. You can set a locale. So yes, it's already internationalized for your use and accept. Now the tool itself is not translated to Russian. But question. Yep. Uh, oh, given that the like Twitter and Facebook are cracking down on. Oh, oh this way. Oh, given that like, apps like Twitter and Facebook are cracking down on fake accounts, does that ever, is, that, is there a potential, like, uh, if you start putting garbage on there, they tag you as a bot? Uh, I think that because the way the Twitter, the way it tweets out, it marks where it came from. I'll show you. How so? That's true. If they thought you were fake and they deleted you, but he's, I mean, in my mind, the, the question too is they could block the tool or they could block any kind of faking mechanism to, to do it as well. And it's identified, you know, as whatever this is, but most people don't look at that in terms of purposes. But yes, that's one of the things my concerns was using it too much or too quickly of being flagged as a misuse of the API or, or whatever else. Yeah, thanks. Uh, could it be extended to be used uh, with automation tools like uh, Selenium, something like that? Yeah, well, the, the, the first part, definitely, um, where it's polluting search history and, and doing that sort of thing. I think that the, you could do the tweeting part of that as well. In other words, the mechanical putting it on social media or the account, but the creation of that content would still need to come from some source. And so that's either pulling you know, pulling text or pulling content from a database or a repo or dynamically generating it like I'm doing. So yeah, I, the Selenium thing has come up a lot this week too, for sure. Um, if you preload a database of images, uh, like that would require some manual work to collect them and to make sure that you're not getting absolute garbage or something extremely offensive, but uh, could you then port it to something like Instagram and just have it upload the image with a text document and... Yeah, yeah, I've thought about I've thought about that already. And the the Faker library actually goes out, and you can tell it a set of eight or ten different uh, topics that it would pull from and give you images loaded. But that's coming from a database. But you could do the same thing. Like there's also embedded in the tool uh, is a script to go out and download a hundred faces from this face did not this person does not exist because that didn't come into being until after I'd already started the project. But that would be helpful too, because you need something that's usable imagery with those accounts and those identities. Any other questions? How long have you been, have you been, work, how long have you been working on this to develop it? Uh, not that, like a year maybe? Year and a half playing with things, but probably a, a year of doing things. But it's been. I have a day job, so this is, and three small children, as I dox myself. Um, but so it's, you know, it's been a while, but. Questions? All right, one more big round of applause Thank for Mike. You. 